Most people remember Brittany Murphy as an it girl of the 2000s or for her untimely death. Her roles in movies like 8 Mile and Clueless and even TV shows like King of the Hill have helped her legacy persevere. Yet there's one film from her filmography that I really wish got more of a shout out. So I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part too. And spreading the word about a Brittany Murphy led slasher where the killer flips the usual formula on its head and instead of going after the horny and debaucherous, instead targets virgins. So join me today on Real Slashers as we take a look at Cherry Falls. What? Did they break up? Break up! Wake up! They're dead! They flatlined. They shuffled off the mortal coil. They croaked and gone to see their maker. Uh, duh! How can you be so critically uninformed? Will you look? The whole school is buzzing with that music. Most slasher films released in this time period really leaned into the meta dynamic that was made so popular in Scream. In fact, the vibe of Cherry Falls matches that of an urban legend or an I Know What You Did Last Summer. Hell, there's even a scene in a classroom that feels very reminiscent of one in Scream 2. You know, the one where they discuss their murdered classmates. The feeling of deja vu is ever present throughout the runtime. But even still, these characters firmly fit into a slasher movie. They're never breaking any fourth walls. Cherry Falls follows a town of the same name, where an insane killer is murdering high school virgins. It's a nice flip on the standard fare of virgins usually being saved for last or entirely exempt from any killings. Brittany Murphy stars as Jodie, and she really fills the typical final girl role perfectly. She's quiet, but she really knows how to scream when she needs to. <laughs> and judging by her introduction, she's clearly moving too slowly with her boyfriend, so he leaves her for someone that will give it up. Or, well, only leaves her briefly. It's weird. In fact, she has a hilarious exchange with her dad. I need to ask you a personal question. About how far you've gone? You know base-wise. Excuse me, what? Are you disappointed that I'm still a virgin? Does she not know how dads in these kinds of movies are supposed to react to that? Oh god. Oh, and her dad is fucking Michael Bean, and he's the sheriff of the town. As soon as a killer shows up, he starts training his daughter in self-defense. This man clearly has his priorities straight. He works great as the overprotective father. He knows a little more than he's letting on, but not in the way that you may expect. In fact, Cherry Falls takes several left turns when you think it's going right. And now students here on campus are rumored to have organized a sex party to actually eliminate themselves as possible targets. I just love how sex obsessed the characters are, as that feels very true to life for high school students. Jody's best friend won't stop staring at this dude to the point of her just constantly staring off and daydreaming about him. And this guy is just a pothead who doesn't seem to care about anything. There's a whole sequence where Jody is getting her boyfriend to suck on her toe and she keeps yelling at him. Harder. Harder. Ooh. Harder. And once word gets out that the killer is specifically targeting virgins, the teens do what any reasonable person would have an orgy. I'm telling you, these guys just have sex on the mind 24-7. This of course leads to the whole crazy finale, where the killer shows up at the party and starts slicing and dicing up partygoers. So much for sex being the answer to their problems. It absolutely feels cut up and like we're not seeing nearly as much as we're supposed to, but there are fun ideas here like everyone's stampeding out of the house or trying to, to the point of a log jam happening at the stairs. If anything, I just wanted the killer to start showing up and start taking out the people at the back of the line. Oh, if only. As is, the killer continues his pursuit of Jody before being flung out of a window and onto some fence spikes. But, as you know for a slasher movie, that just isn't enough. And he then has to be shot a bunch of times. In the arm? Between this lady double fisting these guns to the sporadic editing, I just hope that no party goers were caught in the crossfire here. Mr. Marlinson, he's a killer! Come on! It's... God, just missed! 
Oh, I love me a good whodunit. Maybe it's my love for Agatha Christie or seeing the original Scream at a young age, but I just love the mystery involved. Who is killing these people? What motivations could they possibly have? Will it make sense or just be entirely absurd? And the killer reveal here gives us a little bit of everything. Jay Moore is not who you would think of when it comes to an intimidating killer. But there's something about his craziness that just works. The way this guy just repeatedly stabs his victims or just slams a door on their head. It can be felt with every movement. He isn't a simple one and done killer. And it makes sense too since his kills are very much motivated by revenge. When it's revealed that Moore's Mr. Leonard Marliston is actually the son of Laura Lee Sherman, and things start to make a little more sense. See, Laura Lee was raped by four boys, and then proceeds to be abusive to her love child. It's heavily implied that Michael Bean is the boy's father, but they never outright say. He's targeting virgins because he wants to take away the children from the wealthy parents, even though that point seems a little lost at times. You would think that he just really wants revenge on Bean, but no, that's not really the case either. But I just love how he reveals himself, just simply saying that Jody's father is in the trunk. And there's not one moment where it doesn't appear to be a guy in a wig. Sure, they make a point to paint his nails and have him in high heels, but there's not a single solitary moment where it doesn't look like a dude. So when it comes to the whodunit aspect, you're not really targeting any females in the cast. But it's a great look that still feels iconic. At the end of the movie, we even see what looks like Laura Lee Sherman just before she disappears behind a bus. So Marliston or a copycat could easily still be out there. I mean, heck, it wouldn't be the first time that this has happened. And it's too bad that we weren't able to see another entry because this killer had a lot of potential. Mr. M M M M M M M something wrong with your mouth, Kenny? What do you want? Had we gotten the finale as it was originally intended, you know, full of naked people, then it'd probably be worth a full spotlight here. But instead, I want to focus on what I would consider the most powerful moment of the entire film. When Marliston has both Jody and Brent tied up, he forces Brent to retell the story of Laura Lee's rape. Having to recount that is one thing, but having to do it in front of your own flesh and blood is something entirely different. I'd say Bean's performance is a little uneven throughout the film, but he really nails it here. And this is really where we get to see Jay Moore shine, recounting the abuse at his mother's hands. I love how wacky he gets. While there will never be a good enough reason for killing others, it's nice to see something a little different here even if it gets a little messy once you start poking holes in it. Like, why did Marliston wait 25 years to do this? And just how young of a teacher is he? Then, when Kenny shows up, we get to see this side to Marliston that shows just how manipulative he can be. But there's also a flamboyancy present that I wish was there earlier. It would have made him slightly more unique, but maybe they didn't want to show their hand too soon. Thankfully, Kenny is on to his bullshit immediately and comes to the rescue. Given what a fuckboy Kenny has been to this point, it's a nice change for him. But unfortunately, this is where we see the end of the sheriff. The reason I came here was to ask you, as friends and good citizens, to come forward to me or my staff with any information you might have concerning this terrible crime. Cherry Falls released in the United States on October 20th, 2000, and it had quite the journey to the screen. Originally, the movie was to be released in theaters in November, but after having repeated issues with censors, the decision was made to release the film as a television movie. I'm sure you're like me and thinking, wait, a movie that was too violent for theaters is somehow okay to be viewed on television? Well, the distributors had a business relationship with USA Films, so they made the deal to air the movie on the USA Network. This was almost unheard of and was the most expensive television movie ever made at the time. Because of this, there was nothing that could help to alleviate that $14 million budget. Despite positive reviews, there was no chance at a sequel. Unfortunately, we have yet to see the uncut version, with even Scream Factory doing their best to get a copy. Director Jeffrey Wright even acknowledged that he didn't possess the original cut, so this may just be something that is lost to time. 
which is really too bad as there's a lot of potential with the kills here. Even as a TV movie, there's a darkness present here that few films are able to achieve. This is a concept that deserves to be returned to, especially since it's by no means a perfect film. There are awkward music choices and the editing, trying to make it appropriate for television, can be a bit of a headache at times. But at its core, Cherry Falls is a slasher with a unique angle. And really, that's all it ever needed to be. What's in the trunk? You're dead. Usually my preferred horror film about Valentine's Day involves a certain minor from 1981. But with the recently released Thanksgiving paying homage to 2000s slashers, I found myself looking back on them with rose-tinted glasses. Whether it's House of Wax or Rob Zombie's Halloween, there's a schlockiness to them that didn't seem apparent upon release. But in retrospect, there's a certain quality that the 2000s have that I look back on with a bit of fondness. Oh, and since the Super Bowl was this Sunday... Greatest team in the history of professional football, 49ers! Hehe. <laughs> <laughs> so let's round up our cast of recognizable actors, add in a killer motif, and find a scary mask. Because today on Real Slashers, we're getting in to 2001's Valentine. You both received threatening notes, signed JM, and after I tell you I'm looking for a Jason Marquette, you don't think to mention it? I thought it was a joke. I'm Tyler Nichols with Joe Blow Horror, and I love me some slashers. Whether they're good, bad, tame, violent, not so much, stupid, smart, anything in between, I'm down for them. And Valentine is the perfect mix of all of the above. There's a little bit of I know what you did last summer happening with mysterious gifts showing up for all these girls who turned down a boy in middle school. Oh, I hope to God these aren't high schoolers. See, Valentine follows the pretty basic premise of a boy being bullied in school and then taking revenge on the girls who rejected him 12 years later. But what makes it stand out is the cast. Each of these women makes the most of their scenes and we get some distinct characters that will surprise you. First, there's Katherine Heigl's Shelley Fisher. They lean into the V-Day theme hard with her being on a first date. It's hard to sympathize with this girl right off the bat. I understand what they're trying to do with her being on a date with this douchebag, but her rolling her eyes as it becomes apparent that she'll have to pay her fair share. I mean, come on. He even states how she got all of these expensive items. So the fact that she seems almost annoyed that he's not going to pay for it makes her instantly unlikable. But they don't lean into it hard enough to have a satisfying payoff. If you know you're going to kill her off shortly after, then just lean into it more. Come on. All right. I get that this was a different era, but she just comes across like a petulant baby. As soon as I realized that she was the opening kill, I got much more on board for the film. God, can you imagine this being the final girl? That's nice. That's, that's really nice. Next up is Jessica Cofield's Lily Voigt. I always found it ironic that she's in this film because I've always confused her with Marley Shelton, one of the other actresses. Unfortunately, she's probably the most forgettable of the friends, but she does have her moments. She hooks up in an art installation and quickly meets her demise. While it's a very cool visual, her death leaves a lot to be desired, which is a running theme here. Before I saw this film, I always thought that Denise Richards was the lead. And can you blame me? She gets top billing and gets prime placement on the poster. And she's around for a lot of the movie. On the surface, her character of Paige Prescott would be categorized as the slutty friend of the group. Jesus, Paige, it's a funeral. What? Where things get interesting, though, is that she proves to be much smarter and less of a hoe than initially thought. She pours wax on this douchebag's penis and turns down the advances of this detective. It's a nice subversion from the usual, even if her personality is still a bit of a, you know, hoe. Jessica Capshaw's Dorothy Wheeler is one of the most interesting girls in the film as she has a unique past. See, when we're given a look at the middle school dance that pissed off the killer, we also get a look at the girls, including one that they described as big boned. This is what they're referring to. 
a perfectly normal looking girl. God, no wonder eating disorders were such a thing in this era. I mean, what the hell? She's complex, and if anything, she should have been the person who the film was centered around. It would have made the ending even more interesting, but we'll get to that in a bit. Marley Shelton's Kate Davies is our lead, and I've always enjoyed Shelton, so it was nice to see her in a prominent role. Though, the strange thing about the narrative is that it's not exactly clear that she's the lead, at least not in the same way that a Sidney Prescott or Julie James was. No, the story's completely revolved around those characters, and here, outside of the ending, Kate's given nearly the same amount of time as the other girls. Though I'd say that what makes the film a little more interesting is that it takes a little less obvious approach in that regard. But as a final girl, she's pretty dumb. Unable to notice all the signs that make the killer's identity fairly obvious. Because as much as they lean into the mystery element, anyone who's paying any modicum of attention will figure it out right away. Which is another reason why I feel like Dorothy Wheeler would have made for a more interesting final girl. These girls get picked off one by one as we get closer and closer to finding out who the true killer is. And if you're paying any attention, you'll catch on quickly. Dance with me, Kate. No, Adam, I just want to find Dorothy. I'm asking you nicely. Dance with me. Don't make me beg, Kate. Despite knowing that the film is a revenge story for Jeremy Mellon, this is still a whodunit. Sure, it's an extremely obvious whodunit that doesn't really make any effort to sway your initial suspicions, but a whodunit nonetheless. Kate's boyfriend, Adam Carr, ends up being Jeremy Melton in disguise. Again, with the poster, David Boreanaz was one of the film's biggest stars. So he had prime placement in all of the advertising. So just by looking at the poster, my bet was on Angel himself being the killer. But then the movie makes no effort to try and dissuade you, constantly making Adam the only possible solution. I mean, who else is it going to be? The cop? The look of the killer is actually pretty sweet, with the heavy black pea coat doing a good job at hiding their identity. This helps with the little twist later when Adam puts Dorothy in the killer costume, and doesn't look drastically different despite having very different builds. The mask itself looks like an innocent doll, with blood trickling down from one nostril. It feels both unique and generic enough that it could easily be picked up by someone at a local costume shop. Unfortunately, there isn't any signature weapon, and the ones that he does use are rather tame. But the deaths end up being so simple that they feel like a disservice to such a badass looking killer. They're mostly just done so quickly, without much violence, that it makes me wonder how much the MPAA got involved. Even this heating iron death feels like it's going to be much more intense than it ends up being. Simple slashings and non-impactful arrows make for a lame slasher. It's honestly my biggest knock against the film as it checks the other entertainment boxes. Just look at this great scene with Campbell walking into the basement to ignite the pilot light on the water heater. It's beautifully shot with some genuine tension, only for it to end with a simple axe to the back. It feels like such a waste of all that tension. Or even the Denise Richards death, which is on this awesome set and has a fun concept of the character being trapped inside this hot tub that has a clear lid. And the drilling, while silly, is at least a little different. Though, does this guy realize that he's making air holes for her? Regardless, they proceed to just abandon the drill and electrocute her instead. <sighs> it amounts to very few of the deaths leaving any sort of impact. Pervert attack you? Yeah, uh, Jeremy attacked me. He attacked me. Pervert jump buffalo. I, I, I didn't know. Pervert. If there's one part of Valentine that I want to take a closer look at, it's the opening scene that sets off the events of the entire film. The credit sequence shows an old yearbook with a ton of lovey-dovey writing all over it. They're able to establish the girls as well as how they look when they're older. They're also able to establish that this guy is obsessed with them. So it's a good intro, but the editing in this sequence is something else. With such rapid cuts and so many fade to blacks that I question how much of this was just the editor trying to punch up the scene and post. I promise we did not need all of these bells and whistles. But we get a nice little setup where all the girls we meet later on in the movie reject an ugly boy. I love how this kid just looks like a miniature Dwight Schrute. Ah, oh, poor guy, he were just born in the wrong decade. In fact, the kid looks pretty normal outside of his teeth, so it's not even like we're getting an elephant man situation, despite the reactions of the kids making it seem that way. 
The casting in this whole scene is fantastic, with so many of the younger counterparts being dead ringers for their older versions. I mean, just look at this girl. She is the spitting image of Denise Richards. The little details really do matter. After being rejected by all of these girls, he's finally able to find one that will dance with him. Oh wait, she's full on making out with him. Never mind, good on you, Jeremy. His luck doesn't last long as some bullies try and recreate the scene from Carrie, only with fruit punch instead of blood. At least I assume that's what they're doing. It cracks me up how quickly this girl goes from macking on him to going, oh gross, no, get away. And the whole reason that I wanted to talk about this scene is that Jeremy ends up creating this whole elaborate plan to get back at these girls, even pinning the crime on Dorothy. Okay, fine, she publicly rejected him after she'd already accepted him, so he's likely to be mad about that. But what about these douchebags? They strip the dude down to his underwear and beat him up, all in front of the rest of the school. Get these guys go unpunished? It's the girls that deserve to be stalked and killed instead? I get that this is a slasher and the preferred victims tend to be female, but come on. If this guy is going to want to take vengeance out on anybody, it should be these assholes. Why not make these the boyfriends of the girls who are prodding them on? Anything to put the blame on the girls. It just, yeah, doesn't work and is kind of funny. It's uh, awfully late. You gonna be okay in here all alone? Oh, yeah, yeah, I've got Chad, my corpse. <laughs> oh. Valentine released in the United States on February 2nd, 2001 and ended its worldwide run at over $36 million. Given its $29 million budget, it was just barely profitable, but with marketing costs, including a very expensive Super Bowl commercial, it wasn't the return on investment that Warner Brothers wanted. The film was absolutely despised, with only an 11% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. The overall critics' consensus was that Valentine is basically a formulaic throwback to conventional pre-scream slasher flicks. Critics say it doesn't offer enough suspense or scares to justify its addition to the genre. And despite thinking it deserves a little higher marks than that, I do agree with that assessment overall. There's a lot to like here, and this could have easily been one of the better slashers of the decade but the MPAA absolutely cut this poor thing to pieces and gave us what could have easily just been a PG-13 slasher. But that's not what the filmmakers intended it for, so we have all of this setup, but no punchline. It's rough. And while fans have been clamoring for an unrated version, the studio has shown exactly zero signs of interest. So the likelihood of that happening is about as likely as us getting a sequel. The cast has moved on to some big things with David Boreanaz moving on from Angel to Bones. Katherine Heigl, of course, blew up due to Knocked Up and Grey's Anatomy, although her bad attitude relegated her to lesser fare. Jessica Capshaw, yes, that's Kate Capshaw's daughter, also had a Heigl connection, with the two both appearing on Grey's Anatomy. Anatomy. Marley Shelton continues to kick ass, appearing in 2022's Scream, as well as Taylor Sheridan's 1923. And Denise Richards is now on OnlyFans. So you just never do know where things will end up. Unfortunately, director Jamie Blanks, despite showing a lot of promise here, has been relegated to composing films versus directing them. But hey, at least he's still involved in the industry, and he should be proud of many elements of this film. I know it's gained a bit of a cult following over the years, and while I mostly view it as a movie with a ton of potential versus actually being good, I understand why so many people are drawn to it. Because despite its boring kills, there are some really entertaining moments. And sometimes for a holiday slasher, that's all you need. In 2004, I, by chance, caught the Chicago premiere of a mean little slasher called Toolbox Murders. A remake in, you know, essentially name and concept only. Toolbox Murders is not only an underrated early aughts horror flick, but one that is quite unseen as the general horror-loving community honestly has slept on this one. If you have any interest... No, you are, because it's f or warp. Here's my pitch. Directed by the legendary Toby Hooper and starring the always talented Angel Bettis, Toolbox Murders is a cynical post 9 11 slasher. Mixed with jet black humor, poking fun at LA culture, this has a cool setup alongside clever, gory, and mean spirited kills. So, you know, expect spoilers going forward. I am fully recommending Toolbox Murders. And for those on board for a revisit, let's go. Nice hearing from you, Carlos. 
I've come to realize that the defining line between eras doesn't quite solidify until you are far removed from it. Maybe because the 80s and 90s were already coded by the time I could, you know, conceptualize the differences. Or that social media has blended the lines between history and current reality. But the early 2000s were an awkward period of transition. Yet, as it always does, the trope style and ambitions from the decade has come into its own. Toolbox Murders defines that part of the era better than some of its more popular contemporaries. Nell, played by Angela Bettis, and her husband Stephen, played by Brent Rome, have just moved into their new apartment during the big renovation. Lesman, as in this building? Lesman? The historic old hotel. That's now a shithole apartment complex run by the charming slum lord Byron, the great Greg Travis. A killer lurks throughout the old hotel killing residents via the tools in his toolbox. But when Nell's newly made friend All Out disappears, it'll lead her deep into the Luzman's long and suspicious history and the killer that inhabits it. Toby Hooper, a master of horror and a man important for one of the greatest entries of the genre, has always had an eclectic filmography. You know, when compared to Wes or Carpenter, Hooper may not have had the same amount of hits but I've really come to appreciate the variety in his filmography. There are some unloved gems in there. His serial killer slash killer croc flick, Eaten Alive. Of course, giving us one of the creepier vampire iterations with Sam Slot. A 50s inspired alien invasion with invaders from Mars. Hell, I've been saying for years that Mangler is really a misunderstood B-monster movie. With Robert England going for broke. Power is what holds things together. But towards the end of his career, he returned to his slasher roots with Toolbox Murders. Opening with a cameo by Sherry Moon as Daisy Rain, we get a stormy LA night, a moody and atmospheric location, and a brutal kill with a hammer. Toolbox Murders works because it puts us in the shoes of decent people, Nell and Steven, trying to move on from a tragedy and make a better life. And of course, they just get f***ed by the universe. The hotel turned apartment is literally falling apart on its best day, and it looks like the keyhole from Ford Heights at its worst. The inhabitants are kooky, strange, or dangerous, while the staff is little to no help. Of course, outside of my man, Marco Rodriguez, who always gets the Rick Dalton point every time I see him. I'm like, yeah, dude makes everything better. Toby Hooper does a good job and sets up the main residents and their lives lived here. And of course, they start dropping out of existence one by one. Nell is the first to really notice something isn't uh, quite right. She's a bit nosy, cleverly aware, and doesn't take the strange noises at face value. As I mentioned earlier, there is a bit of black comedy. It almost borders on satire, with it being pointed at the residents and this seedy yet charming take on LA. We're really a quiet building. Did I give you the storage keys? Dude, this guy is great is so odd and slimy, yet likable. Steven's asking about leaking water and, of course, a stove. Nell brings up the shower and Byron keeps backing out, trying to just keep talking long enough to get out the door and damn near run away. I mean, his entire goal right here is just leave before I have to fix anything. Julia, played by Juliette Landau, represents the lonely, health-obsessed Angelino, who, new to the internet thing, leaves her webcam on constantly. And there's Saffron, the new agey chick that's into rough sex and uh, punk. Chaz Rooker, the kind and chill old East Coast man who knows the key to life is less stress. Now, yes, these may not be uh, deeply in-depth character studies, but I enjoyed the side characters more than I'd normally do. You know, with such a dour and cynical tone, I really enjoyed how fun everyone ended up being here. As I've mentioned, Angel Bettis is just so natural at being kind and strong. Every time she shows up in a movie, it's instantly better. You see, that year I caught the Chicago premiere of this, and honestly, I knew very little of the movie itself. All I remember is that it was introduced by Bettis, who uh, had a few, though in all, in all honesty, we all did at that point in the night. I know she was cute and charming and doing a bunch of crowd work. The screening had the right amount of laughs, cheers, and applause. It was a hell of experience and something that I think back fondly on. What I appreciate about the writers Adam Garash and Jace Anderson is that Nell is instantly suspicious and basically plays detective while everyone around her dies. 
making Nell the outsider that isn't being stalked or even related to the hotel story. You know, I think that kind of keeps the mysterious atmosphere and the threat of the unknown. But let's be honest, the slasher really lives or dies on its kills. And man, this is where Toolbox Murders shines. Now, I'm gonna be honest, YouTube won't let me show much, but you know, I'll do what I can. We get Daisy with a hammer to the head. Saffron gets nailed to death. Julia takes a drill through the back of the head. Louise, we get his hands nailed down and his face melted with lye. Byron gets his spine snapped. And real quick, I love his desire to end it all. And of course, Ned loses the top of his head. You know, there's just something about the grimy aesthetic that I love here. And looking back, this was clearly the style of the time. Cinematographer Steven Yeldon does a lot to add to the overall uncomfortable atmosphere. And honestly, Coffin Baby is a great slasher villain and one I wish got a proper sequel in, instead of this murky rights cash grab bullshit. And something that's not advertised in the trailer or original box art or any of the marketing was the cool supernatural twist. I hate this cover here because I think it ruins it. The entire time you're supposed to believe it's probably Ned if not somebody else in the building. I always prefer a bit of mysticism in my horror and, and making the killer a monster, I think makes this story more interesting. The occult, hotel spells, Coffin Baby needing to keep the building intact for its own survival. It's all great. The red herring is Ned, of course, and, and obviously he was too obvious to begin with, but I do appreciate how damn awkward and creepy he is, just by misreading social situations. He's lost a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's be quite clear, he's uh, basically a non-violent stalker. And they even play with him being the killer until the very last second. I mean, if we're being honest, uh, Ned is the real victim here. The victim of shitty management. One thing I, I want to mention is that Chaz was uh, originally, and actually still is even in this cut, a ghost. <laughs> it's why he seems so poetic and calm. The only man who isn't bothered by the decay of his surroundings. And if you think about it, this ominous warning is the perfect giveaway. These renovations, they can't be good. Opening the place up like a patient anesthetized upon a table, not good. Only the scene where Nell finds his skeletal remains in the group of bodies was cut for time. So I think the, the real weight of him sort of being undead is lost, but still a cool thing to know about. You know, I often wonder when Toolbox Murders will get its reevaluation. It's not trying to change the genre. But with a magnetic cast led by the always amazing Angela Bettis, inventive kills, fun thrills, and some great 2000s angst, I hope that in my lifetime I see this get the respect it deserves. Toby Hooper gave us one of his better movies near the end of his life. And as a guy that always came off down to earth and cool, thanks for everything you gave us. The masters of horror that I was raised on are slowly leaving this plane. And whatever existence lies on the other side of the barrier, thank you for everything you did. And until then, I shall smoke a cigar in your honor.